cap of ants. Hello, my brothers, and welcome to the third and final part of the surreal game Iceberg. We are now at the fifth tier, and things are going to start to get a bit wacky, a bit goofy, maybe even a bit zany. Ooh. If you have not seen the first two parts, don't worry. It doesn't really matter. It uh, You can start from here. It's It's okay. But if you think the games I talked about in the last two videos were surreal, then... Oh, oh, oh boy, shit's about to get, uh, it's about to get a bit goofy. Holy moly. Starting this fifth tier, we have Cosmology of Kyoto. Cosmology of Kyoto is an adventure game made by Soft Edge for the PC in 1995. The game is a first person exploration game where you explore the ancient city of Kyoto during 10th century Japan. Like most good exploration games, it doesn't really have a goal and is non-linear, allowing the players to explore in their own way. The game is quite a full basket, exploring themes such as horror and religion, all while managing to stay educational and teach players about ancient Japan. Japan. The art in this game is just terrifying. It's really well made, but it's really disturbing. You can see why it's down so far. The Meteorite Motel is a very, very, very surreal RPG Maker game made for the Giza Gus franchise. The game follows Giza Gus, an old man and grandson, as they investigate a meteor crash site known as the Meteorite Motel. Throughout the game, you find out that a suspicious colony lives nearby and they harness the power of the meteor. The visual style for this game is indescribable. There's no words for it. This game is whack. This entry refers to a game seen in a video made by some ordinary gamers. The video is titled, A Weird Russian Game I Found. And in the video, he plays and explores a mod made for the game Serious Sam. The game appears to be very basic, offering no gameplay other than getting from point A to point B. The areas in which he explores are very large and empty, and the lack of audio provides a sense of eeriness. Close to the end of the game, it starts to get a little more disturbing, with things such as limbs appearing in certain areas, and cryptic messages written in Russian appearing on the walls. Eventually, after exploring down this deep hole, he gets murdered by a funny looking lady and the game crashes and his wallpaper gets changed and his virtual machine shuts down. Epic. Fucker in the Woods is a very strange looking visual novel from 2017 where a group of teens venture into a forest in order to investigate a disappearance of one of their friends. This game is uh, it's fucking terrifying. I, I fuck, I hate, I hate how it looks so much. The way the characters' faces are, th the way they move around, like fluids, I, f I hate it. It's so gross. It's a pretty well-made game, but I, I hate, I hate how it looks. Fucker in the Gulag is the long-awaited sequel to Fucker in the Woods, made in 2019. I'm not playing another fucker game, so I'll read you the description of it. It's a nice sunny day at Syringe Beach, and roided up beef star Ryukaze and his wise old friend Orc Master Jones are soaking up the rays and oogling at the babes. Their life of luxury is soon interrupted, however, when an old acquaintance bursts into their lives with an offer they simply can't refuse. But if something sounds too good to be true, it rarely is. The group soon find themselves hopelessly lost in the clutches of a vast conspiracy that could threaten all of mankind. Only one question remains. Who is the f***er in the gulag? This iceberg has made me mentally ill. League of Piss, yes, that is the name of the game, is a game made from 2018 for the website Glorious Trainwrecks, an entry that was in the last tier. The game is a perfect example for what kind of games can be seen on the website. League of Piss is a mixture of a visual novel, as well as a ton of different other genres. It has some pretty thrown together visuals and audio, as well as a very loose story. In the description for the game, the developer says he made the game while his brain was fucked up. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty clear. I hope I hope he's better now. 
Crime Zone is another game from the creative genius, the Catamites, the person behind a ton of other games on the iceberg, such as Goblet Grotto, Of The Killer Games, Space Funeral, Murder Dog, The Captain Skull series, and 50 short games. This one developer is single-handedly carrying this iceberg. Crime Zone is one of their lesser known games, where you walk around this hand-drawn place called the Crime Zone. You play as a cop, questioning citizens and solving crimes. There's also an overarching plot about this hotel that keeps attracting people to it. While definitely not the best game from the Catamites, it's still pretty good, and I can't wait to see what else they make. Every single game they make is a banger. Nobita's Biohazard is an RPG maker game from 2009. The full name of the game is Doraemon Nobita's Biohazard, or in English you might know it as Nobita's Resident Evil. The game was one of the biggest RPG maker horror games of its time, being in the ranks of Ao Oni and Yume Nikki. The game is a parody slash crossover of the first Resident Evil game which reenacts Raccoon City's mansion incident in the context of the famous Japanese slice of life manga Doraemon, starring the cast from the manga as the protagonist. The game is very well known for its darker interpretation of the light-hearted Doraemon series, as well as its solid gameplay among the Japanese RPG maker community, and also the fans of Doraemon. Antumbra is a very odd and surreal point-and-click horror game made by Vilehead in 2015. While I've never heard of it before now, some of you might have as Markiplier and a few other YouTubers played it back in the day, showing their reactions to the insane shit that happens in this game. In Antumbra, you make your way around a terrifying brown landscape, talking to different creatures and making your way past them. This game is littered with jump scares, with one happening whenever you say or do something wrong. You may recognize some of the art in the game. A lot of the creatures in the game are made from popular creepypastas and other disturbing imagery that can be found on the internet. Also, Jesus is in the game. Jesus Christ himself. A Legal Crime Game is an amazing RPG Maker title from 2015, where you play as a guy named Crime in the city of crime, committing crimes and getting money by committing crimes. This game ended up being a lot longer than I thought it would be. It contains quite a large variety of crimes to commit, something I would hope for from a game called the Illegal Crime Game. Such, such a good game. Threme is an amazing first person shooter game made by a guy called Leon in 2016. The game is described by the developer himself to be a horrible first person shooter, made with love but with no shame. I reckon that describes the game perfectly. In Threem, you play as a camera with a champagne bottle attached to it, and when you click, you shoot, um, I, I think, I hope, I hope it's champagne. You explore this one level with a ton of strangely positioned stolen 3D assets, while a bunch of very misplaced stolen audio from games and TV shows play. Also, this image is plastered everywhere for some reason. Prosperity Path is a batshit insane website that hosts a collection of games called Orbs. According to the site, each orb is designed to coach you through a mindful training process that will cleanse your karma and attend to a multitude of life problems. These karma cleansing games are a very simple way to be happier. This website hosts quite a large number of games, with each one looking the exact same but with a different title. And better yet, each game cost $6 each. I'm sorry, but I, I don't get paid enough to buy and play any of these. Also, I'm banned from PayPal, so I couldn't buy them if I wanted to. PayPal banned me for buying a miniature toilet on eBay. So if you want to see someone play it, go go watch my boy Vinny from Vine Source. Also, you can apparently pay $6 to do a seance with Elvis Presley himself. The site says, sure, he's got a lot of fan mail to wade through every day, but what the heck, you might catch him. I really can't tell if this site is a joke or not. Gobbo Goes Adventure is another title from the developer Roman, the guy that made Funny Pizza Land 1 and 2, both games that were featured earlier in the iceberg. The game features the disturbing and gross 3D look that his other entries are known for. In Gobbo Goes Adventures, you play as a gross looking little man named Gobbo as he saves the world from climate change. It's an isometric puzzle game 
where you control Gobbo, moving him in four directions while clicking and dragging objects to solve puzzles. According to its Itch.io page, Gobbo takes place in the Funny Pizza Land universe and occurs between both games. I gotta say, the game does do a good job at depicting a world ravaged by climate change. There is no way in fuck I would want to live in this world. This game, this game made me turn my air conditioner off. My Hole is a Mouth of Dirt is a strange horror game from 2020. It's an RPG where you play as a guy named Simon who has built a chapel underground under the command of the saint after being told that the world is ending. Simon is left underground for an unknown length of time until emergency sirens are heard as the ground starts to shake. The same voice from before tells him to head deeper underground. The majority of the gameplay features Simon venturing down four different layers with the first one containing abandoned mines, the second one containing an underground garden, the third one containing a mix of machinery and religious references, and the fifth one being a gross hole made of flesh. Simon encounters this area after awakening back into layer one and escaping the mouth, even after he escapes the flesh hole. It's never really clear if Simon truly escapes, since the flesh hole is known as the bottom layer, likely being outside of the mouth. To me, this game clearly seems to be some sort of commentary on religion and hearing messages from God. It could be making fun of doomsday preppers and the people that prepare for the biblical end of earth. Either that or the main character is just a guy that lurks 4chan all day and hears voices. He just like me for real. Screamy Bingus and the Krungy Spingus is a fictional game created by Tumblr user Uten Tajen in 2014. The game was first posted as a joke image with a fake Amazon page, but after it gained a ton of popularity, Uten Tajen made an animation and two albums based off it. The creator originally imagined the game to be a haunted point and click adventure game, but it never got made. Since then, a wiki has been made detailing the quote, fake law behind the non-existent game and god damn is there a ton of war the name of this entry scrimmy bingus and the krungy spingus family edition refers to the real game made in 2015 by newgrounds user krogus interactive i'm not sure if it was something to do with the newgrounds player but the game didn't load for me i sat at my computer and watched the screen for like 10 minutes straight. The gameplay I'm showing is from Vine Source Vinny, and from the footage it appears that it contains an actual game. The gameplay seems to revolve around finding the Bingus before Lord Zordog takes over. Epic. Bugger World is a really good and really underrated RPG maker game made by Sebastian in 2019. In Bugger World, you play as a rabid diseased dog that lives a happy life in his tunnel made from blood. That is until one day when the dog's home is invaded by clowns. The game follows the adventures of the rabid dog as he makes his way through different areas of Bugger World, meeting strange characters such as a sentient bullet. As you explore, you undercover the clown's plot to take over the rabid dog's reality Reality. Towards the end of the game, you learn the person behind this invasion is a powerful wizard by the name of Funny Man. He wishes to take over the dog's reality in order to test out his powers. However, the rabid dog, fueled by a religious hatred towards clowns and love for his reality, comes out on top and defeats Funny Man. I really, really like this game. It's definitely one of the best games on the iceberg. While it's not original, the game has a really good soundtrack. I found myself head bobbing during each battle. I wanted to learn more about the creator of the game, so I had a look at their Twitter page and uh, oh god. Chu Tang is a point and click adventure game made by the godfather of surreal games himself, Osamu Sato. This game is also the sequel to the game Eastern Mind, The Lost Souls of Tong Nao, a similar game that was on the last tier. The game takes place an unknown amount of time after the first one, in which the player meets a character named Nan Shu from the first game. Nan Shu explains to the character that he was sent to guard the island of Chu Tang, but the dark entity named Chu broke him into pieces. The game revolves around Rin, the same character from the first game, finding the different pieces of Nanshu. Initially, the game was in Japanese only. However, on November 11th, 2020, seven years after the game's rediscovery, a full fan translation was created for the game, meaning non-Japanese players could experience the story for the first time. This game has the classic crude drawings and 3D models found in the first one. 
Strawberry Cubes is an unorthodox platformer made in 2015 by Lauren Schmidt. The game lacks a conventional control scheme and players are encouraged to try pressing other keys on the keyboard, which have effects that include warping the player across the screen or changing the visual presentation of the game. Without a user interface, the player is required to use context clues from the simulated glitches and bugs in the game to progress. There is no end to the game and it's left for the player to explore explore the spaces in the game to uncover its features. One of these features includes the addition of hidden messages and images in the game and its files. Not sure why it's down this far on the iceberg to be honest. While I haven't heard of it before, there's heaps of coverage of the game on the internet, unlike most of the other games in this tier. Soup 0.9 is an indie exploration game from 2007 that's heavily inspired by LSD Dream Emulator. In Soup version 0.9, the player explores a linear set of dreamlike locations in a 3D environment, some of which may contain interactable NPCs and other objects of interest. Each individual room may be explored for as much or as little time as desired. The player may move on to the next location simply by touching a wall. The game spans across five different days, but what's weird is that once you finish one of the days, the game closes. The game doesn't even tell you, you're just meant to know to reopen the game to play the next day. Now, now that's what I call player agency. Exitiskita, I don't know how to say that word is a survival horror game made for MS-DOS in 1994 by Andrew Spencer. In Ectastica, you play as either a male or a female and explore a town collecting items and attacking demons. Just take a minute to look at this cover art. Now, uh, back to the gameplay. What, what the fuck happened? Despite the graphics, this game is pretty solid from what I've seen online. It's actually ranked 69th in the top 100 games of all time on a list made in 1996. Not sure if that's meant to be a joke or not. The World Has Been Sad Since Tuesday is a very short ASCII game based off a story of a very old man with enormous wings. In the game, you and a couple find an old man with angel wings washed up on the beach. After the couple decide to take the old man into town, you sneak into their truck and follow them. When in the town, you find that the angel is now sitting outside a church, being swarmed by a herd of people asking the old man to perform miracles and cure their ailments. When you finally get to talk to the old man, the feathers that you have collected throughout the game leave your hand and attach themselves to the old man's wings. After this, the player and the angel become one, and a text box appears saying the world has been sad since Tuesday. A quote from the original story. What this is meant to mean, I'm not sure. I haven't heard of this story until now. Apparently the story is about the contrast of a beautiful angel and a gross old man and how humanity reacts to it. That's what I could find by looking on spark notes. Also, the music in this game is really atmospheric and I had goosebumps the whole time while playing. While it's only about five minutes long, it's a very moving game and it's one that I'm gonna remember. Paranoia Escape is a PS1 horror game made in 1998 by none other than Screaming Mad George. Screaming Mad George is a special effects artist known for his work with my all-time favorite director, Brian Usner. His work in the movies Reanimator and Society will remain in my brain for the rest of my life. This guy is a, is a genius. He's the Danny Elfman of practical effects. He's behind some of the most surreal imagery that has ever been created. How this guy creates the stuff he does, I have no idea. His game Paranoia Escape is often considered to be one of, if not the most disturbing PS1 game. The game is a first person pinball game and is quite possibly one of the best looking pieces of art I have ever seen. It looks so good. This game takes place in hell, actual hell, and the environments are created with random body parts, organs, flesh, eyes, mouths, all that yucky, gross stuff. It's really hard to put this game into words. You have to see it for yourself. 
Increpare.com. I don't know if I said that right, is a mysterious website that hosts a large collection of surreal micro games made by what I presume is one person. This website is essentially the WarioWare level select screen, but somehow the games are even more crude and at times a bit offensive. Surrealidade, or Surreality in English, is a terrifying Portuguese point-and-click adventure game made by Demita Kozam in 2020. This game has some really great 3D imagery, and every single screen you see is equally surreal and disturbing. I wasn't sure what the game was about, as you might guess. Despite not knowing what was going on the whole time, the visuals still managed to keep me playing. Makamaka is a very obscure and surreal RPG made for the Super Famicom by Sigma Enterprises in 1992. There is a company called Sigma Enterprises. I get to play this game. I get to play this game. The game takes place on an earth where aliens, giant cannibalistic alien princesses, and evil, faceless ant-men are completely normal, and the main character is the reincarnated form of an alien prince who defeated an evil demon king millennia ago. Now, completely resurrected and at full power again, said demon king wants revenge organizing the Maka Maka Society to conquer Earth. The gameplay consists of seeing insane shit happen and fighting aliens that you come across while exploring. Fins of the Father is another amazing top tier game where you play as a fish named Salmantha as they compete in the big race, all while copyrighted music plays. After racing for a while, Salmantha's car catches on fire and eventually explodes, killing them. We are then sent to Fish Valhalla, where we must ride with and protect Salamantha's dad on a motorbike by shooting marlins. Eventually, you kill the mother fish, and then the credit screen wishes a happy anniversary to one of Kanye West's songs. If that's not surreal, then I don't know what is. Weird and Unfortunate Things Are Happening is an RPG maker game made in 2020 by Unity RPG. The game follows a girl named Alicia, who just so happens to be a psychic, and sees monsters every now and then. I don't know about you, but where I'm from, we call that being schizophrenic, not psychic, but hey, a tomato tomato. The game is a mix of a JRPG and survival horror game, using common mechanics found in both genres. For example, Unlike a lot of RPG Maker games, items are very limited and the player is forced to ration them out. The rest of the game's plot gets very wacky and surreal. Stuff to do with interdimensional travel and aliens. I don't know, I, I didn't get that far into it. Uwa, is that, is that how I say it, is an exploration game made by the developer Uwa in 2020. In Uwa, you walk around several eerie abandoned places at night, picking up items and interacting with stuff in the environment. This game has a great atmosphere and is super creepy. When you play it, it makes you feel like someone behind you is watching. I'm not sure about the story, there might be one but I was probably too dumb to notice it. You have like this building that serves as sort of a hub area that you can teleport to when you get lost. There's no real objective from what I saw, just exploration. The game is still in beta and has been in development for two years. According to a post on the itch.io page in May of two years ago, version three was meant to be released, but I guess it never was. I really hope the developer comes back to it. It's a really good game. He Death is a strange exploration game where you walk around this desert place to pick up black powder that I presume you put into a rocket. I wasn't able to get very far. My game would crash every time I picked up the fourth piece of powder. The game's art is certainly uh, blinding, you could say, and the atmospheric music is uh, rather spooky. Neftaliya is an RPG maker game made by a Japanese man named 14. Yes, his actual name is 14. This game is about a white stick man that is also featured in 14's other games. You play as the stick man as he explores the land of Neftaliya. The goal of the game is to find 14. Damn, this fucking developer thinks he's funny or some shit. 14 movies upon which the game is won. The game is less about looking for the movies, and more about just exploring. While not overly surreal, the game is still quite eerie and uncanny. While it certainly doesn't look like much, this game definitely fits in with the other good RPG Maker games in this iceberg.
Painted Tomb is a bizarre story of companionship, love, betrayal, revenge. In Painted Tomb, you play as a mushroom guy as he rides a horse and watches TV and goes to bed and then burns himself and his son alive. This game is very colourful and painful to look at. <laughs> you get it? You, you play as a mushroom guy and, and the game looks like you're tripping. <laughs> funny. Drugs funny. Help Me is a game made by the one and only Wallace Lovecraft, the developer behind No Love, a really good RPG maker game from ages ago in the iceberg. Help Me is a decision making game where you play as a person living in a surreal nightmare hellscape. In order to ensure their survival, you have to make a ton of life saving decisions or be killed in one of many very, very brutal ways, of which I cannot show on YouTube. I love Wallace Lovecraft's art so much. It reminds me of the regular show and Adventure Time. It's just, it's very nostalgic looking. This entry refers to the games created by the Japanese artist, Bill Bimo. This person has their own website where they showcase their surreal animations as well as their games. They're rather simple arcade-like games with not much to them, but goddamn, do they look insane. Just watch this gameplay, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Master Boss Snoopy is a browser-based text adventure game with one of the best premises I have ever heard. Within the game, a shape-shifting alien has found a Peanuts comic and interprets it as the protocol for human interaction. The alien then proceeds to consume the entire Milky Way and the surrounding galaxies, replacing them with its own body. The universe is then mutilated into a nightmarish Peanuts-themed landscape, as the Peanuts is the only thing the alien understands. Throughout the story, you take control of Wood Snoopy 799, just one of the billions of entities living in a pointless existence in this alien's slowly dying body. The story revolves around Wood Snoopy getting excommunicated from his home and setting out to explore the bizarre and disturbing world. Subway Midnight is a creepy psychological horror game made by Bubby Darkstar in 2021. The game revolves around a young girl that boards a mysterious train late at night. On this train, she encounters several wacky characters and tries to befriend them all while avoiding the main villain of the game and find a way off the train. This game has some really good visuals with a mix of 2D and 3D. This mix is done really well and gives the game an eerie kind of liminal atmosphere. The game has a few endings, some of which are good and some bad. The way the game tells the story is really cool. Leftway is a horror adventure game made by Tong Soon in 2017. This game follows a lady named Nam Pong as she gets transported to a surreal and empty world and must find a way out. Much like the last game, Leftway has quite a bit of puzzle solving and can lead to numerous endings. The game has some really good art and the world that you explore feels so well crafted. Even the areas that contain people feel empty and abandoned. There's so much detail put into each environment, and the hand-drawn aesthetic pairs really well with the setting. There's not much else to talk about without spoiling the story. Also, this game is confusing as fuck to play. Some of the translations just don't make sense, and the game does not tell you what to do at all. No subtle hints through dialogue or the environment. Just figure it out yourself, you fucking dunderhead. Hotel Souls is a banger of an adventure game made in 2019 by Studio Soft. The game follows a pharmacologist that has bought a mysterious gem after going on a long and hard journey. He then decides to take a rest at the Hotel Souls, but overnight, the stone gets stolen. The game revolves around exploring the hotel and the surrounding area to find the stone that was taken. This game is a prime example that a game doesn't need to have a ton of disturbing visuals in order to make a terrifying story. This game's art is super cute, but the game somehow manages to remain terrifying. This game is well worth its price, with it containing a ton of content to explore and a ton of endings to find. I was really shocked when I found out the game was made by just two people. Really, really good shit. Car Tray, meaning catfish in Vietnamese, is a Vietnamese PS1-like horror game where you, um, I, I don't really know. The game has you walk to a waterfall and stare at a catfish on a rock 
for a while until a horde of catfish start to dance around you. They make you float into the air and then you turn into a catfish. Yeah, that's, that's about it. There could be some deep philosophical meaning behind the game or just a <laughs> f funny catfish. Why the fuck did you people make me play this? Deity Driving is an adventure game made in 2018 by Graceless Games. The game revolves around driving a JPEG car around a bizarre and surreal landscape. You make your way through several bizarre collections of images that make up environments where you talk to more JPEGs with text-to-speech voices that say some wacky and quirky stuff. This game apparently won an award in 2018. Yeah, uh, well deserved. Very well deserved. Urban Dream Bog is a surreal walking simulator where you stroll around empty buildings, petting blue dogs, punching shadow people, and collecting floating goat heads. Something that you could catch me doing on an average Wednesday afternoon. There really ain't much to this game, as far as I can tell. But it does have some really good music and sound design, so there's that, I guess. Sunken Heads is a very underrated adventure game made by Horsehead Interactive in 2020. In Sunken Heads, you play as a random guy that has picked up a package behind a dumpster, only to be transported to an eerie and surreal dream world. Throughout the game, you explore the world by sailing to different areas, finding coordinate disks so you can get to the next area. Each area is host to dozens of characters with some pretty, pretty quirky dialogue that are only exemplified by their amazing sprites that stare into your soul. This game is quite long, with six unique endings, containing an insane amount of content for being a free game. It should be a crime how unknown this game is. I have no idea why it doesn't cost money and why no one talks about it. I cannot recommend it enough. Sluggish Moors Pattern Circus is the 2021 entry in the Sluggish Moors series, a series of games that had its own entry earlier in the iceberg. Like the other games in the series, Pattern Circus is a claymation narrative game with a very complicated and hard to understand story. Something about temporal phenomena and space and aliens, I think. Some big science-y event happened and you play through the experiences of eight different characters and discover the effects it had on them. The game's art is really good, making use of a combination of Scott Cawthon looking CGI and claymation. It's definitely the highlight of the game. The story and the dialogue is not too bad when you can actually understand it, but that's not too common. Maybe I'm just brain damaged or something, that could be why. Mummy Sandbox is a surreal adventure game made in 2021 that was inspired by Minecraft. In the game, you play as a mummy as you explore through abandoned sandboxes, rebuilding your mummy body, exhuming corpses, and becoming the best mummy possible. The game was made as a part of the haunted PS1 demo disc in 2021, and later got its own standalone release on Steam later in the year. While it's a bit short, the game is really good for what it is, and ended up being quite deep. It really made me question the meaning of life. Also, grave digging is epic. Storms is a short RPG maker game from 2015, created by the developer Milk Cyclops. In Storms, you play as a white blob man that needs to find the correct key in order to escape before the storm comes and takes away his chances of getting a victory royale. All the keys you collect are fake and disintegrate upon touching them, and the storm ends up killing you. After that, uh, you walk around some more. The game probably has some deeper meaning about the consequences of the industrial revolution or something, but I had to stop playing. The music was assaulting my ears and I couldn't handle it. Muldullah Malom is a game made by the creative genius Mason Lindroth, the man behind one of my favorite games, Hilux 2. <clears throat> Go, go watch my video on it, it's really good. This game is a claymation metroidvania made with Mason's usual visual style for the Ludum Dare 40 in 2017. The game features a cool blue guy who I assume is a uh, Malda La Malom as he roams a surreal claymation world. This gameplay as well as the environments are what inspired the mini game segments in Hilux 2 and you can definitely see the comparison. It even shares the exact same sound effects. It's a really pretty game, and definitely worth checking out just for the visuals. 
Blood Eye is a 2D puzzle game made in 2016 by Australian developer Simon Webber about floating eyeballs. In Blood Eye, you simultaneously control a group of eyeballs to solve puzzles and get to the next area. There's not much to it. It's a short and sweet, well-made puzzle game with some really good visuals. From what I can put together, the game is meant to take place inside a person's mind and the player is just an observer, but I could be wrong. Skulls is a lengthy, surreal adventure game made by Pizza Makes Games in 2014. The game follows a skeleton that has mysteriously woken up on a cliff. The skeleton then finds a talking skull by the name of Yendor, and the two go on a surreal journey to uh, walk around and do stuff. The game has some good visuals and sound design, and the dialogue between the main characters is quite epic. The game also has a sequel called Skulls and Skeletons that was made the year after and is equally as good as the first. Liminal Space Visual Novel is exactly what it sounds like. It's a visual novel that takes place in liminal space. The story follows the player eating some suspicious yogurt they find in their fridge, participating in some even more suspicious lab tests, and being transported into several liminal spaces. While the dialogue and story of the game are not really the best, making me feel like I'm playing an old creepypasta game, it's the areas you explore that are the highlight. Even though they're just common liminal space photos ripped from Google Images, they're used quite effectively. They make the player feel safe one moment and in danger the next. The game really uses the eerie feeling you get from these images to its full potential. Nehru is a short space funeral fan game made by Meat Baby in 2016. In Nehru, you play as a guy named Garrett who is a worthless piece of human trash and a disappointment to his family and loved ones. As you would, Garrett decides to go on a journey in order to make his life worth something. The game is a bit bland. You quite literally just walk from area to area. That's, uh, that's about it. Color Out of Space is a very weird arcade game made by Rani Baker in 2016 for the Tarot Card Game Jam. In the game, you play on a biblical looking arcade cabinet as a hand in a cloud flying around space zaps stuff with lightning, revealing symbols and stuff. I have no idea what this game is or what I'm meant to do in it. I'm not at all versed in the occult or tarot cards, so I don't know what any of it means. Oh, and uh, for some reason, your coordinates are displayed in the top of the screen. Cool. I have no idea why this game is so far down. I did not make this iceberg, please don't bully me. This game is a classic PC game from 1999. What I know this game for is being one of the inspirations behind the art in Hilux 1 and 2, with both games sharing the digital dithering technique found in Cosmic Osmo. Cosmic Osmo is a point and click adventure game where you control a guy in space named Osmo, exploring planets and completing puzzles. This game has a really cool and unique mechanic allowing the player to switch to a microscopic view in order to find hidden shortcuts and it looks really good with the art style. The game eventually got a sequel in 2007 which was completely different from the first game and also gave me the realization that Osmo is a green alien. All this time I thought it was just a human spaceman. This entry refers to the series of point-and-click adventure games made by the developer Squinkafar Productions. These games are very quirky stop-motion detective games that follow the character Dominique Pamplemouse as he solves crimes and randomly bursts into song. There's currently two games in the series. These games are very crude and I honestly can't tell if it was made by a child or not. The voice actor is either a young child or a woman with a child's voice. There's just no way to know. Blue Sunday is a short narrative RPG made in 2021 by a group of three developers. In Blue Sunday, you play as a man named Shell, who has awoken in a strange and very bright place, with no memory of who he is or how they got there. After talking with several characters, you find out that you are in fact dead and are in the afterlife. The gameplay consists of digging up graves of your loved ones and regaining your memory. I love how this game is about regaining your memory and all the puzzles are memory puzzles. It's a really cool detail. 
I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the main character has died while drunk driving, and the game is his life flashing before his eyes as he fades in and out of consciousness. After talking to all of your loved ones, you can speak to the embalmer that allows you to finally die. As you die once and for all, you relive the scene of you talking to your wife with the wreckage of the car in the background and the screen slowly fades to black. This game is very well made and very depressing. It's definitely one of the saddest games I've played and is definitely going to stick with me. Kirstum is a demo for a game that was made by Glamour but I don't know when. This game was deleted, but I was able to find a re-upload in some reddit thread, so I was able to play it, and I'm really glad that I did. Kirstum is unlike anything I've played before. Yes, it's surreal, of course, it's in the surreal game Iceberg, but it's more than that. The atmosphere is just so well made. It's like a fever dream, but it's still grounded enough to keep you immersed. Kirstum is a dungeon crawler where you walk around a dungeon, interacting with wacky characters. Each time you talk to a character, you can decide to either talk to them or attack them, which I really like. You can see everything the game has to offer, without getting into any fights. There's not much of a story, or there might be one and I didn't understand it. It's a shame this game was deleted, and from what I can see the developer has completely disappeared and has stopped uploading on social media. I don't know, maybe they died or something. God fucking damn it, dude. I thought I was done with this bullshit. Fucker in the Ashes is the third game in the Fucker series, with the other two being at the start of this tier. I'm sorry, but after subjecting myself to the first two, I refuse to buy and play this game. So instead, once again, I'm just gonna read the synopsis. It's a brisk day in the green zone, and Ryu Kaze and his cast of pals reflect upon their misadventures of recent memory, discover the origins of Ryu Kaze, get lost in the infinite back alleys, and relive classic moments in HD graphics. Can you handle all the plot twists and gamer fills? Or will you collapse in a heap and cry for no reason at all? Fucker in the Ashes is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. These games fucking suck, P please stop making them. Will You Ever Return is an RPG maker game made in 2015 by Jack Spinoza. The game follows a man who gets shot in a mugging after a romantic date. The man is then sent to hell and the player must guide him through the different layers, being guided by a Virgil, much like in Dante's Inferno. The game makes use of claymation as well as stock images and looks really, really bad. This game might be funny to some people, but to me it was a bit cringe. It's not too bad or anything, it's just a bit, bit doo-doo, bit poo-poo. Magnus Amargo is a hidden object adventure game made by Sons of Welder in 2022. I played this game for quite a bit and uh, get ready, say it with me now, I had no idea what was going on. The name Magnus Amargo can be translated into Great Transformation, and I, I guess it kinda suits the game. There's a few sequences in the game that feel like you're undergoing some sort of change. The gameplay consists of clicking on arrows to go to different areas, where you find hidden objects and complete puzzles. I did not really like the game, to be honest. It left me feeling very lost and unsatisfied. It seems like it's a bit unfocused and doesn't know what it wants to be. Apparently this game is a sequel to another game, Magnus Failure, that has similar gameplay but is presented in a top down view, rather than in first person. Me not playing the first game could easily be why I had no idea what was happening, but even then it really shouldn't be. Liminal Exploration is a PS1 style exploration game made by Te Develop in 2020. In the game, you play as a frog man as he explores several liminal spaces. No fucking way, that's crazy. Getting to the elevator in each area to get to the next one. The game has some pretty cool movement mechanics, allowing the player to shoot a rope and swing on it. Too bad you can't jump though, so unless you fall off a ledge, you can't really swing. There's also these black orb things that you can shoot. They don't do much. They just emanate an ominous arm while they push you around. There's also a physical camera that the character can pick up and take photos, which I really like. The game has some very photo-worthy environments. It's just a shame the game was a bit buggy 
I wasn't even able to get past the first level. There could be some mechanic I'm missing, but I wasn't able to get to the elevator of the first level. Room Explorer 2010 is a game from 2020. This game was made by Squoom for the website Glorious Trainwrecks. This game fucking rocks. Definitely the best game in this tier by a mile. It's a short point and click game that follows a man who wants to explore rooms. The player starts by entering their room. After fiddling around with a potted plant and a hat rack, the player pulls out his new Kellogg's brand phone. However, he can't log into it because he's not pressing the thumb scanner hard enough. After pressing the button with the power of 10,000 suns, the player snaps their finger in half. It's now when the mascot of the game and tutorial guy shows up. He missed his flight and he was late. He was too late though. He wasn't able to warn the player about the danger of the new Kellogg phone. We are then transported to a hospital where a doctor tells us to fill out a survey. After entering our brutally honest answers, the doctor tells us that we will get the results to the survey in a few days and then the game ends. 10 out of 10. Game of the year. Super Bogus World 2 is a mini game collection made from 2014 to 2020 by the developer Who Bowl. In Super Bogus World 2, you play as a cat named Borgus as he drives around a surreal landscape completing various loosely connected minigames in order to progress. I don't know if it was my fault or not, but the game was very, very, very laggy. This game makes you download some sketchy looking installer in order to download the game. This game was really good, but I'm sure it would have been a lot better if it wasn't running at like 10 frames. Also, I found a really weird coincidence. The last game I talked about, Room Explorer 2010, it uses music from this game. That's that's pretty cool. Reap and Sow is a Yume Nikki fan game inspired by Harvest Moon, made in 2013 by the developer Ao. I'm not sure why it's down this far. This game is pretty well known. Most people know this game from the evil farming game mystery. A few years ago, some Reddit user fell asleep while watching a Vine Source livestream where a joke was told about an evil farming game and the user remembered it the next day as a game that he actually played. The game was meant to be a farming sim like Harvest Moon, where the player must manage a farm all while hiding the murder of his wife. Many people suspected this game to be Reap and Sow, and for good reason. In Reap and Sow, you take care of a farm during the day, and at night, you explore your dream world. The dream world is a huge world, with everything from factories with robots to magic forests. The dream world will eventually tie into the real world, and you can use some crops that you grow on your farm to affect the dream world. While not quite the same thing as hiding the corpse of your dead wife, it's easy to see how someone would label it as the evil farming game. Taiwan 2001 is a lost game made in Taiwan as a parody of the game Hong Kong 97. I actually made a video about this game about a year ago, but it got taken down because the outro had a two second clip of a monkey smoking, even though the clip I used was from a YouTube video with millions of views. Very epic YouTube. After I made the video, I actually got an email from some guy who sent me the game. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not Lost Media anymore. I can send it to someone if you want to give it to the Lost Media wiki or something. I honestly have no idea how to go about it. I don't know if the game works either, because when I go to play it, it says I'm missing some file. I think it's because the game was made for Windows XP and my computer is Windows 10. So if someone knows how to fix it, uh, let me know. Ah uh, yeah, never, never mind. The the game was found. I'm actually stupid. Worm is another game made by Michael Riftshire in 2019. Unlike his other game, I Solemus, a game that was in the last tier, Worm is just an exploration game, not a horror game. This game is really good, and you need to just experience it for yourself. It's free to play on Steam, so go, go play it. It's a claymation game, as you can probably tell, where you click stuff and watch animations play, and goddamn, are the animations good. At points it feels like you're watching a music video and you forget you're playing a game. You literally feel like you're dreaming when you play it. The game makes use of the mouse cursor in really cool ways, letting it interact with the environment and change shape. It's so relaxing and satisfying, seeing the different pieces of clay mold together and transform. Go wishlist this guy's next game. It looks like he's making another horror game like a Solemus, and he's also making another exploration game like this one. I can't wait to play them. 
Nemuru Mayu is an obscure Japanese PlayStation 1 game made in 1991 by the developer Asmic Ace. The game tells the story of a demonic tome that hides itself in Tuscany, Italy. The tome has entrapped the souls of four knights. In the game, you control a random human that has been sucked into the tome and given the title, The Accursed One. The player must explore the dungeons within the tome that are associated with each of the four knights so that all souls in the tome can be freed from the demon's influence. The game is a first person dungeon crawler where you make your way through a bizarre world, fighting strange enemies and progressing through different dungeons. Unfortunately this game does not have an English translation and I wasn't able to play it. It definitely looks like it's worth a go though. Mario 19 refers to a spooky video that was uploaded on YouTube titled Mario 19, Martin and Mario's Wonderful Adventures in 2022. The channel it was uploaded by, Vibing Leaf, looks to be a creepypasta channel, posting fake gameplay of fake EXE games, and this video is just some of his regular content. The video shows someone playing Mario on an NES emulator that appears to be haunted. The game plays normally until the player meets a strange entity that has been transported into a strange world. The strange world is essentially a surreal Mario Maker level that was made to be impossible to beat. Throughout the world, the player meets the entity a few more times until Mario dies or something. I don't know. I, I can't read Japanese. I did it. I did the unthinkable. I'm talking about a game that's not in the iceberg. I know, right? C crazy. This game was actually made by one of you, one of the brothers. The game was made by Starion Invictus, and I was asked to play it quite a while ago, but um, I kind of forgot about it. But don't worry, I, I always, always deliver, eventually. Fleshless is a puzzle exploration game where you control a skeleton as they explore a liminal, surreal world. One day, the skeleton decides to wake up from his grave to uh, explore. I don't know, he might be in the afterlife or something. The game has a few hidden areas and secrets, and the overall gameplay is not too long. I really appreciate the effort that was put into the game. It has a great atmosphere, and the level design is really well done. Good work, my brother. I am very proud of you. That was it for the fifth tier, and we are now onto tier six, my friend. From here on out, the amount of entries per tier will dwindle, as it would with any other iceberg. That doesn't mean there's less content to cover, however. It's very much a addition by subtraction. The games in these next tiers get very nutty. 7864 is a game that I think was made by a Japanese person. I don't know, just read the synopsis for the game. Frying pan, Duggo beaches, in car trouble, repeating. Make sure to fix problem. Not again. Time Lord, help your quest attempt to make world fun place. What the fuck does any of that mean? I managed to find a download for the game on the developer's website and it also hosts a large number of equally strange games that I will probably come back to one day. The game follows a frying pan named Doug that crashes his convertible while outrunning some bill collectors. Doug crashes the car and fucking dies, but is given another chance at life by a genie. Doug then walks around the city getting money and talking to people. I don't really know because I skipped all the dialogue. Who and why someone would make this game, I don't really know. The Wemma of the Drill-Faced Goddess is an RPG maker game from 2018 made by Hexatona. This game is a visual novel heavily inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, a guy that has a cat with a very funny name. Like with a lot of RPG Maker games, I couldn't really get this one to work, but the RPG Maker page has quite a long outline of the story. The game revolves around the exploration of an otherworldly place, inspired by Lovecraft's nameless city where the player makes choices that affect the outcome of the game. It has a really cool and unique art style. I really wish I could get it working without downloading a bunch of RPG Maker files. Find Me A Good One is a short platformer made by Haytham Anaza and Andy Wallace in 2015 for their design and technology thesis. In the game, you play as a girl as she jumps around and does stuff. I wasn't really sure what 
she was doing. I think your brother or someone is sleeping and you gotta go into their dream and uh, send these fly things over to them. The flies might represent dreams or nightmares or something, but I'm not, not sure. While very short, it's quite good for what it is. Where They Cremate the Roadkill is a game made by the Gunseed Collab and John Clowder, the same guy that made both Gingiva and Middens, two games that were featured on this iceberg. This game is surrealism personified. Just fucking look at this. It plays like an RPG, where you play as a weird worm guy in a suit named Cooley as he explores a surreal world. The game describes him as a jobless pleb who has recently stopped taking their pills. Uh oh. The first time we see him, he game ends himself, only to be sent back to Earth by God. Cooley then goes on a journey to bury the remains of his roommate. On his journey, he meets M, who is the wielder of the Devil Tarot card. M convinces Cooley that it's a good idea to go commit mass genocide in order to exact revenge on people that have wronged him in his past lives. It's later revealed that Cooley had previously lived two lives, and we get to experience them in flashbacks throughout the game. The game has a really good story that is only exemplified by its great audio, music, and visuals. This game is about 10 hours long, and was made using RPG Maker, a very limiting engine. It's so high quality for an RPG Maker game, and there's so much content. This game is a masterpiece of graphic design and needs a lot more attention. Ghost94 is a stealth exploration game made in 2014 by a person with a name I really don't want to say. It's a 3D stealth game that takes place in a massive dystopian Japanese city that's patrolled by ninja-like soldiers and heavily armed robots. There's a lot that's fairly unique about the game, with the most obvious being its look. It looks really good, with a late 90s inspired combination of 2D sprites walking around low poly 3D worlds, but it's used in a way that wouldn't have been possible on the PlayStation or the Saturn, creating some gigantic areas and creating a real sense of scale. Void Pyramid is an RPG made by Willy Electrics in 2016. This game has a really cool setting, which is an Egyptian empire in space. It takes place far in the future, where a giant mechanical pharaoh currently rules the wastelands of Earth, and those that oppose him are exiled to the Void Pyramid, an outer space prison populated by criminals and mutants. The main goal of the game is to escape this space prison, a task that has never been done before. The atmosphere in this game is really well put together, and the unique setting is put into place perfectly. The real appeal of the game is its quirky flavor found in the text of item descriptions, object interactions, and dialogue. Every bit of text in this game is goofy and wacky. Disillusion is a first-person dungeon crawling RPG made by Disillusion Dev in 2021. The best way to describe this game is what if LSD emulator was a dungeon crawler with combat. In the game, you wake up with no memories in a strange tower filled with odd creatures. All you have is an urge to climb it. The gameplay revolves around climbing up the tower, fighting and interacting with characters, all while trying to find out why you're there and what the purpose of the tower is. Aesthetically, the developer really achieved what he was going for. The visuals and atmosphere in the game are easily on par with LSD Dream Emulator. Frog Days is a first-person point-and-click exploration game that has been in development since 2017. All I could find on this game was a short gameplay video, which you're seeing now, and a description of the game online. The year is 1995, computer technology is advancing at a rapid pace, and the demand for personal computers has never been higher. Leading computers into the living spaces of millions is Flaming OS, the latest version of the number one graphical user interface that both business and home users choose as their computer's operating system. Even your computer is running flaming OS. However, your computer is special. Mysterious functionality allows you to explore virtual worlds hidden within the operating system and within each world you find. Every new piece of data you discover, there lies clues to one of the best kept secrets of humankind. That's right, an ancient alien conspiracy. February 2003 is an RPG Maker game collection made by five different developers in 2003. The game revolves around a ghost that receives a mysterious calendar in the mail. 
The calendar is for the month of February in 2015. After hanging it on the wall, the ghost gets sucked into the calendar. The calendar is a collection of games made by five different developers in the month of February 2015. For this month, the five developers had to make a new game every single day based on a prompt. In the calendar, you can visit each day of the month and play each game made by the different developers on that day. The game also contains a museum that you can visit. After completing a game, it gets added to the museum where you can look at it. I ended up playing this game for quite a bit. It's quite the masterpiece and I'm pretty glad that I found it. I've only really played about half of the games in the collection. I do see myself coming back to play the others. The Uncle Who Works For Nintendo is an online visual novel created by Michael Lutz in 2014. The game is based around that thing that happened when you were a kid and you would have that one friend who would say that my dad or my uncle works for Nintendo and I can get a Wii before it even comes out. I saw this quite a lot as a kid. The game is set in the 90s and follows a child and their best friend who has a mysterious uncle said to be an employee of Nintendo. Yeah fucking right. The child sleeps over at the friend's house to play some N64 only to find out that there's something off about his friend's uncle. After completing the five different endings and working out the story, it turns out the uncle is some sort of eldritch being and your friend lures kids into his house for the uncle to feed on them. I completely forgot about this game until right now. I remember watching YouTubers play it back in the day. I, uh, I honestly thought this game was some sort of dream I had as a kid. Videot Game is another game made by the same people behind that weird frying pan game from before. I got a warning when downloading this game that it may cause brain damage. I'd say that a good 70% of the games on this iceberg have already damaged the functionality of my brain, so I don't think I'm too afraid of this warning. The game follows the same frying pan guy from the other game. Apparently his name is Doug Beach. You play as Doug as he talks to random people and completes very short mini games tied together with a very loose story. Also the genie guy is in this game. This game is a lot better than the other one and I really do like the art style. Them thick outlines be looking looking good. Oh yeah and uh the warning the warning was right. This game did add to the damaging of my cerebrum. Death of the Agnob is another game made by Jake Clover. In The Death of Agnob, you play as a janitor guy with a massive nose on an alien planet. He leaves his job of cleaning up piss in a bar bathroom to go pick up a shotgun and go on a killing spree. I wasn't able to get to the Agnob though. I fucking sucked at this game. The game has such good art and the ambience and horrific death sounds make the atmosphere really eerie and mysterious. I I swear that Jake Clover is the Leonardo da Vinci of our time. Dungeon Exit is a really short game made by Adam Dickinson with help from the Catamites, a developer that has shown up so many times. This game was made for Eludum Dare, where the theme was Escape. The game follows a knight at the end of his journey in a dungeon. The game tells you to escape the dungeon by pressing Z to jump, but when you press Z, you get teleported through the floor, and pressing Z only sends you deeper into it. After spamming the Z button for a few minutes, the game ends and you get jump scared by some skeletons. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. Hair Razor is a game made in 1984 from the UK that was made by Hairsoft and was released in two separate parts, a prelude and a finale. When the game came out, the players that managed to solve the prelude would then have to buy the finale, where they could then enter a competition to locate the prize, a bejeweled 18 carat golden hair pendant that was also featured on the cover of the game. The prize was worth around £30,000 and it would be given to the player that could find the hidden location in the real world. The gameplay of the game is quite simple, the only interaction is pressing the cursor keys to follow the hair, which moves across the screen and disappears to one side side. Riveting. Survive the Desert is another game made by Adam Dickinson for Illudum Dare in 2011. The game is, um, I don't know, I couldn't play it, it's, it's a flash game. 
The Midnight Station is a surreal RPG made in 2014 by Studio Aijin. The game is a bizarre mess of oddities that were made with the visual aesthetics of the ZX Spectrum PC as an inspiration. This game is surprisingly big and has a ton of content and a ton of lore to discover. The story of the game takes place after the nuclear apocalypse leading to the extinction of mankind. After the nuke, some sort of god guy collected a few human souls to add into his collection. This collection is a bizarre nightmare of surreal landscapes and is referred to as the Midnight Station. The main plot of the game involves exploring said station and finding a way to escape. A Surreal Climb is a short game made by Leon Tanlum in 2020. The game follows a guy that is stuck in a hole and decides to climb a ladder in order to escape. As you climb higher up the ladder, the background starts to get goofy and surreal. What happens when you get to the top? Well, I, I don't know. When you get to the second ladder, you get sent back to the beginning of the game, so we will never know. Top Banana is a platformer game made by Studio Hex for the Amiga back in 1992. The game is quite a simple platformer where the player has the goal of reaching the top of the level, traversing psychedelic and trippy looking levels. I wasn't able to play the game, but I don't think I was missing too much. It looks a bit poo poo. Even the iceberg creator said that they made the entry as a joke, and yeah, that is exactly what this game is. Also, the game's opening almost gave me an epileptic seizure. Do not look it up. Maze Brew is an old Japanese Macintosh adventure game made in 1993 by Maze Box Inc. I honestly could not find much information on it other than a download link for the game. It's a pretty standard first person point and click game where you click on different paths to discover new areas and interact with characters. Other than that eerie feeling produced by the empty landscapes, the game is not that surreal. It's just old. Big Bang is another game for the Archimedes PC, created sometime in the 90s. Like the last one, I could not really find much info on it. Judging by the gameplay alone, Big Bang seems to be some sort of platformer where you control a yellow clown as he walks around collecting decapitated rainbow teddy bear heads while smiling threateningly into the camera. As the game progresses, the stages get even more surreal and eerie looking, and the music switches to an ominous hum. Also, uh, just listen to the death sound. Jesus Christ. I have no idea what this game is. Is it a kid's game? Is it a horror game? Is it a shit post? It's really hard to tell. Beauty Within Its Flaws is a game about being ugly, weird, and bizarre with its visuals, controls, abilities, and possibilities. It's a top-down exploration game made by Rosden Shadow in 2017. This game is a complete mess. The controls are inverted, there's text on the screen that is completely indecipherable. Beauty Within Its Flaws is what I would call an anti-game. It really does not give a fuck. It's just doing its own thing, being whoever it wants to be. I guess you could say, uh, <laughs> this game has quite a lot of beauty to be found with within its flaws. I'm going to paint my bedroom walls with my brain. Ruda is an exploration game made in 2019 by Extinguisher Girl and is all about tripping way too hard at a party. You play as a girl as she goes to a party and plans to get home early to sleep. When offered a drink, she gulps it down. Big mistake. She had too many of the perk 30s. She participated in narcotics too much. She drank too much of the purple drink and now she tweaking. As is standard for these sort of games, she walks around a bit and sees some trippy and surreal imagery. I love that what is meant to be trippy and insane in this game is pretty tame looking compared to the standard entry in this iceberg. I guess you and I have both become desensitized to this shit. Head is an experimental side scroller made by the developer Jars in 2016. In Fuckhead, you play as a man that has his head exploded as he wanders around surreal black and white areas in search for some anxiety medication, all while trying to find some moments of clarity. According to the creator, this game is meant to represent sexual frustration and boredom within a world burdened by the pounding weight of anxiety. Whatever it means, I wasn't able to play the game. 
game, I got stuck on the main menu. I pressed every button on my keyboard and clicked every inch of the screen, but I couldn't get it to start. Either the game is glitched out or these games are starting to get to me. Occludia is a short narrative game made by Dukebot in 2021. In Occludia, you play as a floating guy in a robe that sort of looks like a Grim Reaper. As he completes deliveries for a local pharmacy, the player takes the requested medication to a different customer each day. Obviously, these uh, medications aren't doing very well, as when we visit the customer the next day, they're not doing so good. For example, they made this one guy hallucinate his dead mother. Also, they made this one guy uh, murder and store a body in his apartment. This game has some great music and a good atmosphere. And the town of mentally ill people you explore feels really empty and melancholy. The game is most likely a criticism on the overabundance of medication in society, with people being prescribed stuff they don't need. Before YouTube uh, deletes my channel, I'm not saying medication bad. I am not a doctor. This is not medical advice. Do not listen to me. Boring in Paradise is an unorthodox, endless runner made by Timothy Usikov in 2021. This game has two different parts, Anti-Pain and Anti-Trolley. In Anti-Pain, you play as a sketch of a guy running on the moon while dodging the word pain. In Anti-Trolley, you play as a car in a maze made up of TV static as you try and get to the end without running over pedestrians. That's all there is to the game. I don't think there's any hidden meanings or anything, it's just a very simple entry. Black Room is a browser-based adventure game that follows an insomniac that is trying to fall asleep using a self-guided meditation technique while aiming to visualize an entirely dark space, thereby lulling herself to sleep. She becomes lost in thought, allowing fantasy and memory to intrude into her mind. The game is meant to be a commentary on the issues of gender within gaming culture, and the developer has described the game as a feminist dungeon crawler. Although all of the sprites in the game are lifted from other games. The game manages to combine all these different assets in a way that looks pretty good, which is really hard to do. Dujana is a top-down adventure game made by a Scottish developer, Jack King Spooner, in 2017. The game follows the character Dujana, a Muslim woman in a fictional country that is under the occupation of foreign powers in a stylized, magical, yet realistic world as she tries to find out what happened to her husband and daughter. The game touches upon themes of death and explores them through the stories and people you meet as you play the game. Heroica Voodoo is a Japanese escape room adventure game from 2017 that has supposedly been in development since 1993. This is yet another anti-game with really bad controls and gameplay that does not make any sense and also insane person logic. The story follows the player as they enter into a haunted mansion in order to save a family that were in a plane crash that crash landed into the mansion and have become stuck. Yeah, see what I mean? Insane person logic. Logic. The gameplay involves solving completely brain dead puzzles in order to escape the mansion. I'm sorry, but there's there's no way this game took 24 years to make. What the fuck was the developer doing the whole time? Oh yeah, and uh, apparently all of the art in the game was drawn with a mouse. It looks beautiful. I have no idea how I meant to say this word. I usually suck it up and try my best, but this time I'm actually lost. Tism Tism is a short horror game made by four developers in 2021. The game has you explore an empty and rather scary office building. It starts off as a simple adventure game, trying to find keys to get to the next area. That is, until you get to a floor that is pitch black, and the game forces you to walk around like a scared little bitch with a flashlight. After reaching the end of the room, spoilers, you find a human worm thing. Spooky. This game was surprisingly polished and very well made. I know I say this a hundred times in every video, I am aware, but this game has a really cool art style and atmosphere. Also, apparently the name of the game is an actual Hebrew word. That means the removal of God in the universe at the moment of creation, I think. Not sure how it relates to the game. I wasn't really paying 
that much attention. Infinite is a really psychedelic puzzle game made by Barnacue in 2020. I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna say it for the 100th and second time. This game has a really cool art style. I really do apologize. I can't come up with any other words. How about very epic visuals? Truly amazing illustrations. While I have no idea about the meaning or plot of the game, its visuals, audio, and gameplay are truly unique and unlike anything else. It's a pretty simple puzzle game until more and more mechanics get added and genuine skill and attention becomes required. This game is a breath of fresh air. Most games in this iceberg will have great visuals, but the gameplay was made by a four-year-old, but this game is actually peak quality, 10 out of 10. Rupshot is a fan-made spin-off of the game Off. See, see what I did there? A game that was featured long, long ago in the iceberg. The game takes place after the events of Off, where you play as a guy with boxing gloves instead of a baseball bat, as he goes on a mission to destroy a tower. The plot in this game is actually really cool. After the events of Off, the world is completely destroyed and there is nothing left. But in this game, all that stands is a tower in a void of nothingness. I don't know why, but this plot is really cool to me. This entry refers to the games made by the developer John Candy that were pretty well known back in their day, up until John deleted their Game Jolt page for some unknown reason. His games were thought to be lost for quite a while, but apparently the creator of this iceberg got given a folder containing all of their games. Not many people know this, however, as I found a few comments in gameplay videos and on Reddit of people saying that all of the games have been wiped off the face of the earth. Hopefully, this lets some people know that they've been found. Gala Gala is another game made by Jake Clover in 2013. The game is a platformer where you play as a little alien guy doing I, I, I don't fucking know. Uh, you do you do this. In the words of Jake Clover, sometimes I feel like a video of a game is more interesting than a game itself. So I wanted to try and make a game that is like a video of unfinished games. Yeah, that sounds about right. The Stage is another project made by the developer Jack King Spooner in 2015. The game is episodic, and in each part, you play as a little clay guy on a stage. In each episode, something different and horrific will be on the stage for both you and the little clay guy to experience. This project is really cool, and some of the later episodes are made with the help of some familiar faces from the iceberg, like Kitty Horror Show and John Clowder. It all comes full circle. This project is like a surreal game cinematic universe. It's insane. This game really inspires me as a game developer. How cool would it be to do a collab with some of these developers and make a game that features all of these surreal characters and worlds that we've seen? That would be the best thing to ever happen. Just imagine it. It would be like Smash Bros, but with horrific abominations and surreal looking claymation figures. Satan's Pepper is a horror visual novel made by Ghost Wolf in 2023. In the game, you go grocery shopping, picking up some milk, chocolate, and a censored pile of something. After shopping, you take the only route back to your house through a cursed forest where you were kidnapped by a shadow figure and his dog. After awakening in the demon's realm, he forces you to eat a pepper that he has been making. Supposedly, it contains the purest form of spice. After eating the pepper, your body feels the wrath of 1000 fires. You go to drink the milk that you bought, but it's too late and you die. At least that's the ending that I got. I don't know if there's a way to live or not. I played it twice and died both times. Epic. El Sueno del La Razón. I don't know if I said that right, is a demo for an RPG maker game inspired by Yume Nikki, made in 2015. The game follows a girl named Anne that has locked herself within her room, all because she's become obsessed by her inner demons that are slowly corrupting her mind. In order to defeat these creatures, Anne meets them face to face in the world of her dreams. 
All Our Asians is a 3D platformer made by one of the co-creators of Anodyne in 2018. In the game, you explore the mind of your dying father and explore his life experiences and his secrets. The game is a walking simulator with really good PS1 graphics, and the environments are very surreal, yet they're designed like actual levels from a game, and the music complements all of it. According to some reviews I read for the game, its story is a bit flawed and dumb, like apparently the message of the game is that feeling empathy is wrong and it's bad to be inspired by your family's history. It's uh, it's very based. Kang Fu is a platformer made for the Amiga in 1996 and is the first and only title from Studio Great Effects Development that does not surprise me in the slightest. Kang Fu is a platformer where you play as a funny animal from a funny country, a kangaroo named Klont. Klont is tasked with collecting other kangaroos, defeating enemies and collecting other shit while finding the exit to the next level. The game has quite a bit of depth, with the player being able to use weapons such as egg bombs, boomerangs, boxing gloves, and guns to defeat enemies. This game is Kangaroo Jack, if it was good. Auto Cannibalism is a short game made in 2010 by Tistag where, you guessed it, you eat yourself. You play as a tribesman that is tasked with finding some food to eat in a cave. After going in the cave, you eat a snake and you die from its toxins. You then respawn at the start and go back into the cave and find your body. After approaching your body, the player devours it like the hungry boy that he is and returns to the village. The village thanks you for becoming fat and then they eat you. After eating you, all of the villagers die for some reason. Oh, and also your death noise is the sound of monkeys screaming in pain. Dawn Dusk Dream Sewer is a short narrative game made in 2019 by two Brazilian developers. In the game, you play as what is apparently a meat sack that has a soul attached to it, as it descends deeper and deeper into a sewer system that is filled with pilgrims and individuals that sing the praises of the system, whatever that is supposed to mean. I'm not sure if this game has any meaning to it, but if it does, I, I don't know what it is. Ace Phallic is a first person horror game made by a death or gone in 2020. The game has you explore the collapsing mind of a person that is attempting to escape from reality. The game is split into three different parts, education, contamination, and reincarnation, and lets the player explore quite the variety of surreal landscapes as you make your way through each section. The game has a ton of very effective imagery and audio, and truly encapsulates what a mental breakdown looks and feels like perfectly. Carpo Bomb is a really cool arcade game made for a Ludum Dare in 2022 by Disorder. In the game, you take control of this little drone that moves side to side. The goal is to pick up eggs, put them in a tube, for them to hatch into people, and then bounce the people back into the tube so that this creepy guy at the top can eat them. Gee, I, I wonder, I wonder why this game is on the iceberg. That's that's crazy. Heisei Pistol Show is an RPG Maker adventure game made in 2008 by Perun, the same person that made Rekindle, an entry from early in the iceberg. The game follows a gay hitman named Hart that is betrayed by his ex-lover, and in order to get revenge, Hart and his trustful companion, Pistol, abandon the hitman organization, with three of the best assassins following in their footsteps. The game was made with a strong influence of Japanese art house movies, as well as kabuki theatre, aside from the game's exploration. It also features few puzzles and some boss battles. The game was only translated to English last year, and since then has gained a bit of an audience online, and rightfully so. This game is really good. Boy do I love downloading suspicious exe files from such trusted websites such as Mediafire and opening them up despite the warning from Windows Antivirus or for the sake of this video. I couldn't find any info on this game, all I got was the download link on the iceberg. In Botulism, you play as a fat black guy running around shooting other black guys and jumping over gaps in order to get to the end of each level. Also the music sounds like my butthole. What a, what a fantastic entry to finish off this tier.
Starting off the second last tier, we have Mangia, a game made for the Atari 2600 by Spectra Vision in 1983. In Mangia, the player controls a kid who must eat plates of pasta that is placed in front of him by his mother, who will keep on feeding him until his stomach f***ing explodes. What the fuck? This mother is insane. To prevent the player's brutal death, the player can throw the plate of pasta to a cat that occasionally pops up at the window, or to a dog that randomly walks by. If the mother sees that the kid is giving the pasta away, she will bring three times as much pasta the next time she returns. Just fuck it, just imagine that. Your kid is so full from pasta that he's resorting to feeding it to animals. So what do you do? Give him three times as much pasta. This mother needs to be needs to be taken away she needs to be locked up this is one of those games that is accidentally surreal just because of how insane the premise is punishment is a game maker game made in 2005 by mark essen the game is a platformer with the goal of being as frustrating as possible to complete the gameplay involves climbing a set of screens in tower fashion while indirect hindrances try to prevent you from doing so some of the hindrances include the screen rotating either through the level design or through hitting eyeballs seen on the certain levels and icons which reverse the left and right movement keys instead of being killed the risk comes from falling downwards particularly in higher up levels you could end up dropping several screens with just one mistake this game's developer mark essen is also the guy behind nidhogg which is pretty insane Gideon Towards God is an indie game made by Paul Stan Studio. I couldn't find a download link to the game at all, just a few videos of gameplay. It looks to be an artsy black and white point and click game with some sort of deep spiritual meaning. Not gonna lie, the, the art kind of looks like a 13 year old made it. Geosite is a Newgrounds platformer game made by the user Amon26. This game has some really nice retro graphics with a very deep and surreal story. The game revolves around these two gods of Earth. One of them becomes mad at humans for making war and pollution and all that stuff and kills everyone. The other god gets mad and puts the other god in prison and then the god that put the other god in prison gets lonely and then creates this guy to go and save the other god from prison yeah uh very very deep a day in the future is another entry from the developer Belomco, my favorite developer of all time i didn't even know that he made this game i just downloaded it and played it and I immediately knew that he made it, much like their other games. In a day in the future, you walk around a surreal place, completing wacky and goofy mini games with some amazing MS Paint graphics. All in the far future of 2020, 10 out of 10, best, best game developer of all time. Y and I is an insane sandbox game made by the developer Fruity in 2019. This game is essentially like one of those mobile Minecraft clones you played as a kid because your mom wouldn't let you buy the, the real deal. I honestly had no idea what any of the shit on the screen meant. It was all just nonsense. The only thing you can do in the game is break blocks, pick them up and place them. Also the game runs at like 10 frames per second. Good good shit. Fuck be beautiful game. Glog Willet is another batshit crazy game made by Jake Clover in 2016. This guy sure is appearing quite a bit in these lower tiers, and honestly, it's very deserving. The game is another side-scroller where you control a weird alien guy, explore a wacky and goofy world, and slaughter hordes of people. The game is split into two different parts, each not really containing a story, just some very loose direction. Just like the last two games on the iceberg made by the same dude, this game has a super off-putting and eerie atmosphere with some loud industrial sound effects and music. Chamber of Stars is an adventure rhythm game made by Eric in 2021. It's the sequel to a game from earlier in the iceberg called The Endless Empty. In Chamber of Stars, you play as a guitarist and songwriter named Star, as they receive an invitation to perform at a show as a guest of honor. As of now, the game isn't actually out yet, but there is a demo available for the first section of the game. Just like The Endless Empty, 
The game's art is composed of mashed together imagery and is just as surreal. The game is definitely a lot more upbeat than the endless empty, containing a bit of dry humour and more cheerful music. I guess any game is more upbeat than the endless empty. That game was about a guy dying. Pre-post-modernistic post-ironic daddyism dating simulator don't fucking ask me what that title means, is a dating sim that takes place in space. You play as a guy in a spaceship with what I presume is space tinder. The game makes you play smash or pass with randomly generated alien creatures. After you've selected your dream alien partners, you are shown what your new baby looks like. What an epic game. Why the fuck is Sans here? Mementos Mori is a very confusing game made by Marik Kapolka in 2015. It's a browser-based game where you click and view four different disturbing paintings. Each painting contains a packet of Mentos that, when clicked, will give you a fun Halloween fact. That's literally it. Apparently the Mentos in the game are from a promotion in 1999 called Mementos Mori. The promotion consisted of a limited edition flavour of Mentos. Printed on the inside of each wrapper of the roll of Mentos was a depressing tidbit meant to chill the very soul of the reader, just as the peppermint candy chills their taste buds. I think I get it now. It kind of makes sense. This game is great. Good, good work. Piranic Parasite is a unique walking simulator made by Mohamed Kamez in 2017. I don't really know what was happening when playing the game, so take my re-account with a grain of salt. Piranic Parasite is a walking simulator where you partake in the good kush and alcohol and get transported into the body of a cybernetic human. The game has you journey through the different parts of the body in order to reach enlightenment. The game has a really cool mechanic where you have to throw up some chakra signs by pressing certain keys at the same time, but so do you, like, your hands actually end up making the sign when pressing the keys. I thought that was really cool. Lisa the Insane is a joke fan game made for the Lisa series that is in development by, quote, a loser. That's what the Lisa wiki says. I'm not calling the guy a loser. Also, the wiki calls the game Lisa the Insane when the iceberg calls it Lisa the is sane. The link of the iceberg directs you to some original music from the game, and in the titles and description, the game is called Lisa the is sane. I'm not sure if it's a misspelling and the wiki is just correcting it, or if the game is actually called Lisa the is sane, and the wiki I found has nothing to do with the entry. From what I found, Lisa the Insane has a gameplay trailer and is actually real, and Lisa the Is Sane just has some original music on YouTube. I can't find a download link for either game. This entry has me so f***ing confused. Heart of a Sephilimon is a Japanese horror game made in 1991 for the Japanese home computer, the Sharp X6 8000. According to the Iceberg creator, this game isn't lost media, but despite that I could find f all information about the game. Apparently it's a sequel to another horror game, Horror of Cridwell, which is just as, if not more, obscure. According to some guy on Reddit that is working on a translation for the game, the game starts with the main character waking up in a hospital after having a dream where a woman decomposes after a ritual and sees a girl floating outside a third floor window before disappearing. Apparently the rest of the game is about a cult and explores Lovecraftian ideas. Also the game is meant to be really gory and disturbing and offensive, so there's that. I think this translates to Taradiddle, but I might be wrong. Taradiddle is a very bare bones RPG maker game made by a super awesome Eric in 2015. In the game, you play as a guy wearing cat pajamas as he walks around. Either this game has like two minutes of gameplay, or this iceberg has made me too brain dead to progress any further. When I said this game was bare bones, I meant it. No combat, no dialogue, nothing, just walk. Left up, down right, just walking. I've got no idea what this game is meant to be. Garfield's Armageddon Prophecy is a first person RPG maker game where you play as who I think is John as he's trapped and tormented 
by his fat, lazy, funny orange cat Garfield. The game has you walk around an eerie and strange maze of dungeons, picking up Garfield comic panels and solving puzzles to escape. Also, Odie is there. After exploring for a bit, you put your comic panels into a statue and you get released from the maze, I think. I wasn't too sure what was happening. Garfield kept talking like a philosophy professor. Ugetsu Kitan is another obscure Japanese horror game that was made for the PS1 in 1996. The game seems to be a point-and-click adventure game where, according to a description I found, a young girl guides the player from a busy street to a tent containing a labyrinth occupied by Japanese mythical creatures, in which the player experiences several stories based on the Agetsu Monogatari with vignettes from the original scenario in between. The game apparently follows an old book called a Getsu Monogatari, a collection of nine supernatural tales by the Japanese author Ueda Akanadi. Due to its age and the hardware it was made for, some of the visuals in the game are a lot more disturbing than they should be. Better Dead Ratification is a super obscure Japanese adventure game made for Windows in 1995 by Art Sector 1. The game is a first-person point-and-click adventure game that utilizes early 90s CGI and FMV. The game has the player situated in a bar where they can click on different objects in order to chat with characters. The player is able to converse back, being able to select from several dialogue options. What these options are, I do not know. I do not speak anime. Depending on what options you select, you end up fucking dying, so you, you, you gotta be careful. Super Spray and Slay 3D is a first-person dungeon crawler shooter made by developers Eric and Allen in 2020. In the game, you play as a hotel maid that has been sent to the room 666 to clean up some germs. Turns out that these germs are actually demons from hell. After killing, I mean cleaning, a few of them, you get sent to the hell that they came from. The game has you make your way through six different levels, taking out all of the germs in each, finding keys to progress. After completing these levels, you find a final boss, a giant eyeball germ thing that may or may not be the devil himself. After obliterating him with your cleaning spray, you get sent back to earth. What a, what a banger of a game. Tetric is a Tetris clone, as you can probably guess, made for MS-DOS in 2020 by Fadri. It's described as an MS-DOS basic Tetris game whose special appeal is that the pieces are made of the screaming flesh of damned souls. I couldn't get the game to work in my browser, but the game sounded so cool that I taught myself how to use DOSBox so that I could play it. Was it worth it? No. I was expecting the Tetris pieces to be screaming in agony and writhing around in pain as you place them, but no. It's just a reskin of Tetris. Cringe. Word Image Sound Play is a Japanese PS2 game from 2004, and I use the term game very loosely. It's more of an interactive music video. The game is split into several different sections, with each one containing, well, words, images, and sounds, but not any play. I have no fucking idea what this game is or why it was made. It reminds me of those toddler sensory activation videos on YouTube, but Japanese and live action. Zoku Sagari Ejiri is a Japanese PS2 puzzle game released in 2002 by Enix Corporation. Enix, not Square Enix. This game perfectly represents Japanese comedy. The game, the game is fucking insane. It's completely nuts. It's absolutely bonkers. In Zoku, you play as a CGI guy with an arrow on his head as he walks around a surreal Japanese hellscape littered with insane characters and piles of low polygon feces. Do not ask me to elaborate on that. I don't think that I have the brain capacity to. We did it. We actually did it. We made it to the last tier. Finally. Good god, man. It's, it's, only, <laughs> it's only taken me a year to do. I honestly did not think I would make it this far. 
And to be fair, I have no idea why I have. Some of these games have been amazing. This iceberg contains some of my favorite games of all time, and some have affected my capability of thinking. I have actually gained a decrease in mental capacity from explaining some of these entries. The games in this last tier, as you can probably guess, will fall into the latter category. These some goofy games, man. Auto-generated bitsies refers to the collection of games that have been created using a Python program by Adam Ledox. The program is called Bitsy and is designed to generate a retro-style narrative game. Essentially, what this program does is automatically generate surreal RPG Maker games. Obviously, I had to make one of these. I downloaded the tool and put in a few keywords like Kappa Dance, Surreal, Internet, Toilet. I uploaded the text files and uh yeah it, it pretty much looks like any other game on the iceberg it's like if an rpg maker game had procedural generation and the dialogue was created with mad libs there's not much to it just some random rooms and dialogue but it's still pretty cool <laughs> Produce is another obscure Japanese horror game that was made in 1987 for the PC 8800 by DBSoft. The game is a disturbing dungeon crawler that follows four psychic teenagers, Gilbert, Toshio, Tina, and Sayaka. The story follows the teenagers on vacation, and it turns out that Toshio has a crush on Sayaka, but Sayaka instead has a thing for Gilbert. He's unable to deal with this hatred and jealousy when an unusual opportunity presents itself. An abandoned house calls out to Toshio and requests that he deliver his friends to the top floor of the building. Upon completing this task, the eldritch being within will eliminate Gilbert so Toshio can have Sayaka all to himself. In the game, you control Toshio, using his psychic powers to strike fear into his friends by making illusions of monsters appear. This is all done in a way to get the teens to go upstairs and prevent them from getting to the exit. The gameplay is equally interesting as the story is. It's more of a strategy game than it is a dungeon crawler, allowing you to strategically place eldritch monsters in the way of your friends from a top-down view. Oh, and the, the game has some pretty gross body horror. Also, the game has nudity. That's right, a game featuring teenagers has nudity. Oh, Japan, you're, you're so silly and wacky. Psyche is another entry from the developer Jars, the same guy behind the game, Head. It's another point-and-click adventure game made in 2014 with some pretty cool hand-drawn art. In Psych E, you play as a guy with neither a cock or balls as he explores a bizarre and surreal world with his ego following him. The game has you go from character to character, interacting and talking to them. I didn't get the meaning behind the game. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about the body. For example, at one, one point, you go inside of a woman's pee-pee hole and also the player's inventory is a ball sack like he just opens up his ball sack and stores his items in there this iceberg never ceases to amaze me uzumaki is a strange japanese rpg maker game from 2015 with very little information on it available online the download that i got for the game was linked on the iceberg and was a bit broken i think the game had a few missing assets and there was no text but then again, the game is in Japanese, so I don't think the addition of text would have helped me much. The game follows a young girl as she's awoken during the night. After leaving her room to investigate, a door in the hallway appears that transports her into a strange world with a lizard guy. The world is littered with traffic signs and these little guys that run around. The game is really confusing so i didn't get too far whenever you run into an enemy they trap you in a prison of traffic signs and the only way to get out is to reopen the game and start from the beginning same thing with this bus i got hit by a bus and was trapped in this spooky bedroom maybe the girl's parents were killed in a car accident or something and the whole thing is just a nightmare i have no clue 
This entry refers to the many insane games made by the developer, Jansky. Most of the games that they make are side-scrollers that are made with a ton of stolen assets. Their games bring up a few questions on fair use and copyright. The developer compares the theft of game art and characters with how MF Doom uses samples in his music, which is honestly a kind of fair comparison. Despite the issues of fair use, you really have to commend them on making solid games with such a large amount of clashing assets. There's been a few games on the iceberg that do the same, but none of them feel complete as their own game. It's a really impressive thing to do, and their games are definitely worth checking out. This game gave me a brain tumour. The Jin Goal is an RPG maker game from 2020 about some guy that kind of reminds me of Wayne in Hilux 1. He's got a similar walk cycle. You know when you get those black floating circle things in your eyes and you look around and they sort of lag about? That's what this game reminds me of. I couldn't really get that far into it as the first combat encounter crashes my game, but from what I did see, I don't think I'm missing out on much. This entry refers to the Tumblr blog made in 2015 called KLM or Kameda Love Mail. It's run by a large consistently shifting number of mods that all go by the name Nagato Kameda and they all live together in a house that they call Two Bed Two Bath. Originating as a positivity blog to send love mail to people, it has long since evolved into something else completely, being a place for mods to post about any variety of things, including random thoughts, day-to-day -day happenings, stories, and art. As you may guess, some of this art is in the form of surreal games. The one that was linked on this iceberg was Clown Cafe, so that's what I played. It's a visual novel where you play as Mod Kameda 1862. It's really short and has a ton of in-depth lore about the Tumblr blog and the house that all the mods live in, but it really didn't make much sense to me. This entry refers to the lost unfinished game that was going to be made for a five-part multimedia art movie, Cream Master Cycle. The Cream Master Cycle is a super strange and artsy five-part movie that was made from 1994 to 2002 by Matthew Barney. The cycle includes the films as well as photographs, drawings, sculptures, and installations in conjunction with each episode. The whole art project is based around the male cream master muscle, a muscle in the ball sack that makes them shrink and grow in response to the temperature. I'm sorry, but why and how the f do you make a seven hour long movie about a muscle in the ball sack? The only evidence of this game existing is a really short promo on YouTube uploaded in 2017 that shows a few seconds of gameplay. I have to play this game. I need to know how you make a game from a movie that's about a ball sack muscle. Also, no matter what you do, please do not find this promo and go to the uploader's channel. Just don't trust me, you, you're gonna be mentally scarred. We... we did it. We actually did it. Finally, <laughs> we made it to the last entry in the iceberg. We've come very, very far. Unless, you know, you just skipped ahead. But anyway, we're, we're finally here. The last entry on the iceberg is Space Spy. Space Spy is a very obscure and surreal game made by Vasily Zatov in 2009. This game is quite special. It's easily the worst game I have ever played and definitely takes the title of the most surreal game of all time. As of writing this script, it's currently summer here in Australia and it's about 38 degrees in my dorm right now. I am dripping with sweat and dying of heat stroke. I have no fan, no air conditioning. You have no idea how much willpower it took for me to beat this game from start to finish. Space Spy, I think, is a puzzle game that's split up into six different levels. They follow a mentally ill man that crawls out of the sewers in order to sneak into a red carpet event that he's not invited to. After getting caught sneaking into the event, he gets sent to an insane asylum. After escaping the asylum, he then hijacks a plane and missile strikes the apartment building of the judge that sentenced him to the asylum. At least, that's what I think happens in the game. 
The majority of the story is shown through the text dumps that appear at the start of each level. Along with these text dumps, the game gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to beat each level, and trust me, reading the instructions are very necessary. The puzzles in this game make no fucking sense at all. For example, in the mission where you sneak into the red carpet event, you think you would have to, I don't know, sneak past some cameras and guards or something? No. You have to interact with this telescope that calls down an alien bug from outer space that gives you the power of hypnosis. You then have to hypnotize the policeman so that you can get past them. Once past him, you then have to push a ramp over to a police booth, which is when you unlock the keys to a bulldozer. Then you need to drive the bulldozer up the ramp, destroying the police booth and killing whoever is inside. Then you must collect the police suit from the guard's corpse, and only then can you enter the red carpet event. This was one of the easier levels. I really cannot tell if this game is a joke or not. The walls of text read like they were written by a insane man. Looking at the developer's Twitter, this theory holds up. All of their other projects are very similar in nature to this one. Maybe it's just an art thing. It's just the way he expresses himself. I don't know what it is, but it's pretty epic. Holy fucking shit. We just played and reviewed over 400 games. I am in severe pain. Although technically I didn't actually play every single one. Some of them had no download links and some of them were made a hundred years ago for some obscure Japanese home computer. But uh, tomato tomato. Whether you just watched the last bit or you've been watching from the very beginning, I, I want to thank you. I really appreciate you watching. It's been uh, it's been quite the adventure and I definitely would not have made it this far without all of your support. Thank you. I know it wasn't the most consistent series, I had a few months of radio silence and random videos mixed in between the entries and for that I do apologise. It's kind of a bittersweet feeling to be finished. I mean, the, the majority of my audience came from this iceberg, so to be finished with it feels a bit strange. The next video will most likely be an edited compilation of the full iceberg, so you can just sit back and watch the full iceberg without all the intros and outros and that nonsense. As always, I want to thank my Patreon members. Your support really means quite a lot. Thank you Gage Mendon, Too Funny Too Cool and Bunny Walk. Also thank, thank you, thank you for watching this video. It's pretty insane if you watched this whole video and you've made it this far. If you have like and subscribe and all that stuff if you haven't already. It's YouTube's way of recommending the video to other people. Thank you all for watching and I'll see all of you in the next one.